Hi, and welcome back. Uh, this is going to be the 10th uh, video series, uh, 10th lecture in uh, our series from E375. Um, and so in our last lecture series, uh, we dove into uh, linear models. And in that case, we were actually using a specific data set uh, for soil moisture from Willow Creek, uh, Wisconsin. I just wanted to kind of show folks a little bit, a uh, few pictures of what that part of Wisconsin looks like, as well as kind of where, how those soil moisture and soil temperature uh, data set data sets were actually collected. So they were collected by, uh, there's actually a pit from that site at Willow Creek. Someone dug a hole and installed a whole profile of, of these temperature sensors down through the soil and then filled it back in. Um, so when we were talking about linear models, uh, the last step in linear models was model assessment. Uh, here I want to stop back, step back and say, uh, because model assessment is such a ubiquitous part of this course, as we talk more and more uh, about uh, bringing models and data together, using, you know, using kind of models for data analysis, uh, we're going to talk about the concepts of model assessment more broadly uh, than just in the context of linear models, because it's something we're going to it's going to set up some patterns we're going to uh, use throughout the whole semester as we confront different types of models, not just linear models, uh, with data. But we're going to, in this particular case, we're going to keep on uh, focusing on uh, data from uh, these uh, sites. And so the Willow Creek site up here in Wisconsin is part of a larger network of, of sites called the Meriflux flux tower site where they installed uh, these towers that actually measure a whole bunch of things about the environment around them. Uh, particularly, they're configured to measure uh, the fluxes of carbon and water out of the system. That's what the sensors are going up in the tower. But when they do that, they often measure, measure a bunch of ancillary data in addition, such as uh, you know, your basic micrometeorology, you know, wind speed, temperature, humidity, uh, incoming, and outgoing solar radiation. And then as we saw uh, earlier, the soil and uh, soil temperature and soil moisture. So this is all in all is giving us a lot of information uh, about uh, carbon and water fluxes and carbon storage and uh, basically the, the, you know, the dynamics of the land surface. Uh, so one of the things I'll use throughout this video series is thinking about how uh, models of the land surface actually perform against data more broadly, and, and we won't dive into the details of how those models work uh, at any point in, in their entirety, and that would be a whole other course. Uh, but these are more mechanistically based models than the statistical models we've seen before, and they include, you know, not just the carbon uh, pools and fluxes, uh, but also, you know, the full representation of the hydrological cycle, and then the full representation of the land surface energy bu budget. Um, and so our, our LM model was kind of focused on, our linear model was focused on kind of what was in this uh, energy balance portion of the soil, you know, our ability to understand and predict temperature when we're looking at things related to that. You know, um, later in the semester, we'll, we'll be talking more about kind of soil hydrology and soil fluxes of water uh, and a little bit about uh, uh, photosynthetic dynamics in the canopy. Uh, but that's just a bit of foreshadowing. Okay, so let's say we have output from a model that's predicting, you know, a whole bunch of stuff about how, you know, the envir uh, s uh, environmental system uh, is responding to the natural world. Uh, how do we assess that model? And I'm going to break this down at a high level into three steps. Um, and I'll break those into different videos. And so the first step um, is actually the simplest, but it's really important, which is just a basic sanity check. So this stage uh, actually does not require actually comparing the model to data. It's just based on looking at the model itself, uh, looking at the output of the model itself, whether that be through summary statistics. Uh, you can just take the output and run it through the summary uh, function to get some basic statistics uh, or making some basic plots of what the, the model itself produces. And some of the things you're going to be looking for are the range of values. You know, so does the model predict uh, 
data just over the, the range of reasonable values that we see in reality. Uh, what are the units of the, of the variables coming out of this model? Like do, you know, is the model in the correct unit? So does it make sense to compare a model to data if you, know, the, the, you haven't figured out what unit your model is actually in? This is a remarkably common problem uh, when people start working with more mechanistic models that you know, they, there's a lot of units involved sometimes and, and there can be miscommunication on what you're actually looking at. And then just the general patterns in space and time. And the idea here is, is some models are, are just so categorically wrong uh, that you don't need to compare them with data uh, to know uh, that, they're, that they're wrong, there's something you need to fix. And, and basically, you know, the first step is just to you know, fix things that need fixing before you go down the road of bothering to pull, you know, pull data together and get the data, model and data aligned and, and start looking at output more in more detail. Um, so that wraps up kind of the first step and we're gonna, in the next video, pick up uh, with uh, actual compa graphical comparisons between model and data.